Hi, and welcome everyone. Um, my name is Hillary Godwin and I have the pleasure of serving as Dean of the UW School of Public Health. Um, before we get started with today's lecture, I wanted to um, center us in a land and labor acknowledgement. And I wanna give special thanks to one of our fantastic staff here in the School of Public Health, Tess Matsukawa, who's the one who developed this particular version of the land acknowledgement. It's vitally important for us to know the longstanding history of where we are and what has shaped the context of the land we inhabit. The University of Washington acknowledges the Coast Salish people of this land, the land which touches the shared waters of all tribes and bands within the Suquamish, Tulalip, and Muckleshoot nations. Land that was stolen by European colonizers. Land that was stolen from the Duwamish who are still here and continuing to honor and bring light to their ancestral heritage. This country was built on stolen land with the exploited labor of enslaved African peoples, as well as the exploited labor of unpaid Asian and Latinx peoples. These acts of colonialism, white supremacy, and anti-Blackness are the history of this country, as well as our ongoing and current reality. We want to honor and recognize the lives knowledge and labor of black and native peoples in the past, present and future. There's an immense need for action within the School of Public Health and all other systems that is centered on liberation for black and indigenous peoples. This requires understanding the context of where we are, our own positionality within those systems and a dedication to justice-based action. What better way to introduce today's topic um, and today's OMEN lecture by Lynn Goldman, which is focusing on uh, the cumulative environmental risk impacts of red redlining using Houston as a case study. Um, for those who are not aware, uh, the OMEN lecture is in honor of Gilbert OMEN, who is here with us today. We're thrilled to have you in the audience. Gil. Gil is a former Dean of the UW School of Public Health, and I believe also a former chair of DEOHS, correct? Yes. Um, and uh, we're just so thrilled to have you here um, and to have this lecture in your honor, Gil. Um, Gil, for me personally, has been an incredible mentor um, as a former Dean. He, every time he gets in, comes to town, he meets with me, listens to me and my angst and woes, and uh, offers sage advice. So I, I so appreciate you, Gil, and so appreciate the support that you've shown for the school for years and years um, and that you continue to show us. So really a pleasure. Another one of my public health heroes and mentors is Lynn Goldman. So who better to give the Gil Omen lecture? Lynn is a pediatrician. She um, is also an epidemiologist in, in addition to being um, an environmental health specialist and she is Dean of the Michael and Lori Milken. So it's Michael and Lori Milken Dean of the Milken Institute School of Public Health at the George Washington University. Um, Lynn, um, as I said, is one of my public health heroes. Um, in addition to just an incredible broad array of um, basic work that she has done. She also um, was really instrumental um, in the establishment of California's childhood lead poisoning um, prevention program and also um, federal reforms around um, pesticide law and the 1996 Food Quality Protection Act and also the 26, 2016 Lautenberg Chemical Safety Act for the 21st century, um, which actually set the stage for a bunch of work that I did myself in um, regulation of, of nanomaterials. So um, Lynn, you are just, it's such a pleasure and honor to have you here today. Thank you so much for being here. And I'm turning it over to you. Thank you so much, um, Hillary uh, Godwin, Dean Godwin, um, my friend and colleague. Um, for that wonderful introduction. Uh, it, it's indeed a pleasure to be here um, with you and, and so many colleagues. Um, I'm, I'm realizing how through my career, so many people um, from the University of Washington have been very important to me in many different contexts. And it's, it's fun to see many of you here today. 
no financial interests in this talk, but I did want to start by saying a little bit about Dr. Oman. <laughs> you know, Dr. Oman, I, I never had the experience of, of training under Dr. Oman. I never had the experience of working with him um, in his myriad of roles as an administrator, whether it was in the government um, here at Michigan, the other uh, roles that he served in. But yet when I was reflecting about this talk, I realized that Gil has had a tremendous impact on my life. And I wanted to talk about that a little bit. When I was uh, uh, first, um, first made his um, acquaintance, I was already at the Environmental Protection Agency. I had just been sworn in as an assistant administrator and responsible for the nation's uh, pesticides and toxic chemicals programs. And it, I hadn't even realized the extent to which a lot of the grounding that I had in um, management of chemicals, I had worked before you know, for the California Department of Health and the risk assessment work that I had learned, how much of that had been derived from Dr. Oman's own work. He at that point in time had been appointed to this commission that had been established by the Clean Air Act. And I was asked by um, Administrator Browner to be her liaison to the commission. And that's how I got to know Dr. Oman. And you know, I, 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 some of the things that I would say, uh, one, uh, a person of just tremendous clarity, a thought, a purpose, uh, communicates well, taught me a lot about that, um, isn't looking at the peripheral things. He, he knows um, what his objectives are and he heads that way. I, I think that's a good model for all of us. There, there are so many distractions that we can have on the road, um, so many distractions. But also I, I came into that job at a time when people were very impassioned about pesticides in particular. A lot of strong feelings and opinions about how we should do the assessments that we were doing, the work that we were doing. And I've always seen Gill as a beacon pointing toward the science, pointing toward being willing to be um, tough-minded. And you may believe that something is true, but do the work, do the experiments, do in the clinical trial. And in looking back on, on his career, test, your theory, test your hypothesis. You know, if it doesn't work, if it's not what you thought it was going to be, you have to be tough enough to say, well, I, I guess I wasn't right. That hunch wasn't right. But what's really right is to steer toward true north. And I think Gil does that. I think Gil teaches that. I never took a course from you, but I learned that from you. So I, I have tremendous gratitude. Um, um, toward Gil Oman and the enormous impact that he has made on the field of environmental health, not just here and not just in his administrative work, um, just, I mean, that's been fabulous, but really nationally, and I think also globally. So thank you, Gil. So I tend to like to, you know, be a, stay aware of the big picture. The big picture um, for me, um, uh, much of that has to do with, you know, our healthcare system, which is tremendously expensive. I mean, what we pay um, per capita um, for um, per person, as you can see. We're just trying to get rid of that little thing that's blocking your titles. Oh, the participant oh, thing. Um, oh, it's, okay. it's on sorry, this I'm one. I'm sorry that I'm like. That's all right. I, I'm always, that worked. No, it didn't. You have to get the little X on that little thing. Oh, I, I did. Yeah, that's what we're trying to do. Yeah, but it, it comes back on. See, it's not on this because it's in this silly slice of thing. We could go out and then back in. Yeah, I'm sorry. I should have kept track of you. No, I'm, I'm okay. <laughs> Y'all do what you have to do. I think you might have to get out of the slideshow presentation and into regular PowerPoint, get rid of that thing and then go back. <laughs> we'll never really learn how to use this technology. Wow, I think it's gone. But we need to yes, share screen again. Share screen. 
I think the people. Okay, but is there a little thing now? <gasps> it's gone. All right, the little things are gone. Thank you to Dean Godwin for um, making that happen. And the people know what they're doing. Um, once again, to acknowledge uh, the staff here um, who are fabulous from what I've seen and the faculty and faculty. So the, the bottom line is that while we spend a tremendous amount of money per capita for health and healthcare in our country, um, our spending being out here um, way, way, way beyond um, any other um, country in the OECD, um, our life expectancy is lower. So we, we, have, we have some problems with how our health care system works. And, you know, I think arguably, you know, some of that um, has to do um, with, uh, with public health. Now, let's see, try this one. That will do it. Ta ta. So, and, and this is from a national, um, actually, it, National Academies use this, but it's actually from um, in, in 2017, but it's also from the Bradley and Taylor article. And in terms of the fact that while our healthcare spending is very high, and you see us circled in red, our social services spending is fairly low. And when you add them together, that actually some of the countries that have better health impacts than we do cumulatively spend as much or more than we do. So some of this is focused, it's, it's, it's prioritization, um, the, um, the kind of thing that perhaps uh, Dr. Oman used to do in OMB. So our life expectancy at birth, um, which is a, a, a very um, important number, is just you know, tracking with that same um, pattern, um, whether you are um, a female, X or O, male, um, identified um, by the um, vital statistics system. A ditto, um, our suicide rates um, are, are fairly high. So we have, we have mental health issues as well here. We're fairly similar to Japan, but much higher than other OECD countries. Um, deaths for cancer, we actually do fairly well. We do fairly well. We've put a lot of effort, I think, into cancer identification, cancer treatment, earlier diagnosis. We pay for cancer treatment um, pretty generously. And I think we've done well with smoking. Um, potential years of life lost per 100,000 people, though, again, um, the United States, um, many, many more years of life, life lost than um, other OECD countries of the other rich countries, basically. And of course, our infant mortality rates are higher. Infant mortality is intrinsically bound up with years of potential life loss. The earlier you die, the more years of life loss um, for that person. So the, the environment is, is a piece of this. And you know, when, when I've worked on environmental health with the National Academies, you know, we've talked about the environment is really being about the built environment, the social environment, and the natural environment, you know, defined very broadly. And you know, that's despite the fact that I started, you know, with pesticides and chemicals and risks that you can quantify that way. But we have to recognize that the environment is, is a broader thing. Now, for the sake of full disclosure, I am from the scenario. I grew, was born and raised in Galveston, Texas. And so I've always had a fascination um, with many of the environmental issues around that area. Um, the um, um, light show in my community was drive past Texas City, Texas at night and see all of the refineries flaming off all different colors of um, flames and smoke and fascinating things. Um, and what me and my brother thought was fun to do on an afternoon is if the DD truck, D truck was out there you know, fogging to get on our bicycles and try to keep up with it and, you know, ride our bikes in the fog. So um, definitely um, I experienced uh, that kind of toxicity, but there's another kind of toxicity which has to do with the stress that people live under. And at the beginning, um, Hillary mentioned the legacy, you know, in our country 
of land being taken from native people, but also of slavery. Houston and that area has an enormous legacy from slavery. It is much more than they ever taught me about, certainly in Texas history. Um, Texas history classes were all about how Sam Houston was a hero and the people in the Alamo were heroes. And you know, now I know <laughs> that you know, part of why they wanted to create the Republic of Texas is so that slavery could expand into Texas. That's what they wanted. And so you know, we, we weren't taught that, and, but it is a reality um, of that environment. And part of that, but this is hardly unique to the South. I wanna make sure that this is understood. <laughs> I, I, I know that the Confederacy wasn't here in Washington, but I also know you had redlining here and we had redlining everywhere in our country. And so um, y'all Yankees can't just point at us and say, you know, you Southerners are the complete, you know, problem with racism because racism is a problem in our entire country. I think we all are aware of that. And in Houston itself, and you can kind of see um, that's um, the inner beltway. Um, and these are the neighborhoods that were redlined and they had different um, ratings. Um, a D rating was you know, considered to be worse by the banks. They really couldn't get a mortgage and the A ratings were you know, the good um, communities. And so from, um, from the beginning when Houston was just being uh, created as an urban area, there was this differentiation, you know, between whether you could get a loan, um, get a mortgage or not. And this is from the 1930s, but it, I think it predated that. And when you look at the area in terms of the occupation by various racial and ethnic minorities, the minority populations are still um, concentrated and I'm looking to see if I have a pointer, but I don't. But um, you have to see, I'm gonna come up here for a second. That's kind of the earlier footprint. Um, and you can, you can see that the, where the red was um, for the red lining um, is, is where we see more of the minority populations, especially the yellow, the black or African-American populations as well as uh, the, the, the green areas, um, which are Latinx there. Where growth has been occurring has been outside of that inner core, into the suburbs, into the areas you know, surrounding the city. And when that growth happens, what happens? There's a lot of paving. There's a lot of concrete roads, homes, other solid surfaces, Areas that had been pine woods, had been meadows, had been you know, marshland are now very heavily developed. The water has to go somewhere. The water is heading toward from the top left corner to the bottom left corner down what's called the ship channel and into the Galveston Bay. The water has to flow down and it's flowing down through that area of you know, historical redlining. This is um, from um, the Harris County Public Health Department. They mapped um, a, a metric that was created by the CDC and ATSDR called a social vulnerability um, index, which um, is kind of a sum of um, traits uh, such as not only race, but also poverty and also um, income disparities. But what you can see, and they actually do it this way, that area that was considered to be good back when the redlining was done is where you have the lowest vulnerability and, um, and the areas that were redlined are areas where people have the highest social vulnerability. And it's not gonna be surprising to you <laughs> to see, and, you know, as I said before, where we're going to see risk of inundation and that's these red areas are the areas that are moving in, you know, toward the bay, but also in those same neighborhoods that were redlined, that are historically minority and have more social vulnerability. So it's, it's a terrible combination of risk, physical risk from the environment, as well as poverty. And the result is that when a storm like Harvey happened, you know, this is the kind of neighborhood 
that was completely inundated and where people had a hard time escaping um, from the flooding. And um, the, the shelters in, that were there um, were not um, really working uh, for people, the hospitals. Um, this, um, this area corresponds to one of the red areas down um, on, the, on the lower part um, near to um, the former um, baseball stadium. And they weren't really prepared uh, to deal with all the medical emergencies that they had there. Um, as, as you know, many of their hospitals flooded. It was hard to get ambulances to people when things were completely flooded. Um, so what are the other kinds of environmental risks that are suffered? So I'm currently working on a study from the National Academy of Sciences where we're looking at um, the constellation of risks for people along the Gulf. And unfortunately, many of these communities that are at risk for flooding and are very vulnerable uh, to climate change also are at very risk, at very high risk for toxics. And in fact, <laughs> Hurricane Harvey, one of the major plants, the, the Valero plant, had an enormous release of benzene and other toxic uh, materials. The people who lived um, in proximity to that were trapped there to breathe that. They had no way of getting away from that. They, um, uh, they're in, if you can see, you can kind of see the arrow again. Right? That same phenomenon of the higher income area being the area that has the least toxics as well as the least flooding, the least social vulnerability and so forth. So the, the inequities there are pretty stark. Um, a meeting that I was I attended a few weeks ago with some members of that um, community near the ship channel on the lower right. Um, they can, they're on the other side of the fence from a plant where they can hear PA announcements that say shelter in place, you know, to the workers in the plant. And there they are in their homes and nobody's giving them any advice about what they should do. That's the, that is the kind of stress that people are living under. It's also true that there are higher levels of lead in the drinking water in these same areas. There's been less of a willingness to invest in that drinking water infrastructure to make the drinking water safe um, for that community. These are things that we see over and over again across the country, but I think, you know, illustrative of the, of the multitude of risks. And, and I'm remembering when Dr. Roman said, we need to broadly Think about cumulative risk. What is the cumulative risk? In environmental health, we have tried to reason that through. What if it's three chemicals? What if it's four chemicals? But how do we do cumulative risk when it's also the risk of, and it's the risk of lead, it's the risk of toxics, you know, from the chemical plants and the refineries, but it's the stress from flooding, it's poverty, it's social vulnerability. We, um, as scientists, haven't been good at that yet. Uh, one of the interesting things about Houston is how actually environmental justice was first invented there, right? At Texas Southern University, um, the, the first work that was done to kind of ma map where the to toxic sites were in the country by census tract came out of Houston. But Houston itself um, is, um, is really a microcosm for this and, um, and an area where um, people can, can understand that further. And that's just as a lead to remind us that, you know, the exposures certainly have been going down um, in our population. This is for children between the ages of one and five. But we still have a lot of lead in our communities and the, these older houses that have lead-based paint, the industrial sites, lead in drinking water, which has come up as a more important issue. And now also, you know, Every time I pick up the newspaper or consumer reports, there's lead in juice or baby food or in the consumer reports a couple of months ago, dark chocolate, which breaks my heart, by the way. <laughs> and those of us who are a little older in particular have been impacted um, by lead. I think that um, this, um, Sabella says that I'm, I, I'd have to pull the reference for you now because I don't know why it's on my slide, but the age cohort of uh, people who were born between 1950 and 1980 
particularly had a lot of lead exposure as children. So I'll count myself in that age cohort. And I think many of you in the room are, and, um, and that's, that stays with us. So what is the science behind how we might think about these cumulative impacts? And I would argue that one thing that we could do is think about how epigenetics might play a role. Um, we know that many diseases do not show perfect concordance even among identical twins. Identical twins um, have very similar height um, and kind of similar, you know, when it comes to reading disability, but even, even autism, identical twins uh, it, do not have great concordance for a trait like autism that, um, or Alzheimer's disease, schizophrenia, and, and on and on and on. Um, some like diabetes, MS, there's very little twin concordance. So there, there, there have to think, be things going on in the environment writ broadly, you know, whether it's your diet, the exposures that you have in your environment, the stress, whatever it is, it's certainly not just genetic. And so epigenetics, you know, it's, I think you all know what it is, that this is why, you know, a muscle cell is different than a skin cell and, and why we're able to develop from a fertilized egg to be, you know, an, a very complex organism with every cell having the same DNA sequence. And so I'm not gonna go through all of that with you, but some of these changes are, are heritable and stable and, and some are not, and we're still really learning about all of the different ways uh, that um, our um, cells control gene expression through epigenetics, whether it's DNA methylation, histone methylation, histone acetylation, and I think there's now microRNAs and all kinds of other ways. And so we, I, I would argue, understand our genome much better than our epigenome. And the more that we've learned about our genome through sequencing and and then doing studies to look at the genetic causes of different diseases, the more we've appreciated that that's overly simplistic. At, at the very best, a lot of diseases are multigenic, not singlegenic, but many of them you can't explain very uh, well just through sequencing the genome. The diethylsilbestrol, which was something that happened um, early on in my life, um, and was certainly very important. And that is that women were given DES during pregnancy to prevent miscarriage. And they, um, it was discovered um, by actually a physician at, at Harvard that women um, who had taken DES during their pregnancy, that their daughters were very likely to be born with vaginal abnormalities, um, higher risk of some, a certain kind of cervical cancer and so forth. And, and that has led to a, a lot of scientific research and I think it's been very um, important in terms of beginning to understand um, some of the mechanisms that might be involved with how our bodies um, are changed to exposures. So eventually it was realized that not only were the daughters likely to have these birth defects and they were likely to have cancer as young women but the women prescribed the DES, as it turned out, had a 30% greater risk for breast cancer. So they themselves um, were impacted by it. And, and, and the DES daughters, um, the kinds of complications were not only the carcinoma and, um, and reproductive tract changes. I had friends who had to go in for exams all the time to make sure that they weren't developing cervical cancer because their mothers had taken DES during pregnancy. Uh, those of you who are young enough that you don't remember this, it, it was really quite devastating uh, for many of these daughters. Um, but some of them then went on to have pregnant, pre pregnancy complications and infertility. They themselves, after the age of 40, through long-term follow-up, have been found to have higher rates of breast cancer. And eventually it was found that even um, the males exposed in utero had urogenital abnormalities, um, um, such as undescended testicles and epididymal cysts, and um, especially if the exposure was in the first 10 weeks of gestation. And there's a broader array of diseases that have been documented um, among people who are exposed to DES um, prenatally, 
um, diseases that more might be more associated with metabolic disorders, um, cardiovascular disease, heart attacks, hypertension, elevated um, cholesterol, um, things you don't think of as being caused by an estrogen, but uh, actually um, in this, what they were. So, you know, how these late, ex late changes can be explained, the folks at the um, NIAHS actually have done a lot of experimentation with mice around this, and they do demonstrate epigenetic changes um, that have occurred um, in these um, mice, um, in particular um, histone modifications and, and actually other changes. Um, the other one that you've probably all heard, yeah, everybody heard about the Dutch famine, right? Um, yeah, so, so I'm not going to, I'm not going to spend a lot of time on this, except to say that once again, it's the first trimester of pregnancy, women who were affected by the famine, um, babies born too small, with a long term follow up that showed a number of metabolic problems with glucose intolerance, <laughs> coronary heart disease, and so forth. And interestingly, with the Dutch famine, um, effects in the next generation, the grandchildren of these women, um, showing um, decreased um, DNA methylation of the same imprinted gene that um, their um, parents had. And um, that to some extent, um, these um, um, babies also had increased adiposity. So if our epigenome can have that kind of a, a dramatic effect, um, again, I showed you genes, you know, twin studies uh, for diseases, but twin studies for the epigenome show interesting things, which is, and I'm sure you've all seen this, but the three-year-old twins have very similar um, epigenetic marks, but when twins are older, even if they're identical by the time they're 50, their epigenomes are very different. And in this case, this is DNA methylation, but which is to say that over the course of a lifetime that our interaction with the environment, stress, diet, whatever, because you move people out of your first three years of life, if you share your genetics, you also probably share the environment, you shared your inner uterine environment, you've probably even eating about the same thing but over a lifetime, these twins actually have different trajectories biologically. So are changes that are caused by our interaction with the environment, are they necessarily permanent? Um, I have found hope in this work that Dr. Gilarte did, one of the other public health school deans, former colleague of mine at Hopkins, Tomas years ago took rats and gave them lead when they were pregnant and studied their offspring. And he, I, I went into his lab and, and watched what he did, which was pretty interesting. He had these water tables that he would put the rats into and they couldn't see, but there were little islands in there. And so, you know, the rats would swim around and find the little islands and get on them and get out of the water. And then he could, test how long it took them to learn where the islands were, right? And then if he moved the audience around, how long would it take for them to figure that out? You know, it was really kind of his way of saying, how smart is that rat? I'm, I'm, I'm giving you all this detail because it's up to you to judge, what is, does that mean they're smart or not? But I think for a rat, probably it does. But, <laughs> but the, the thing is that the, as you might expect, um, the rat pups that had higher lead exposures in utero had a really hard time figuring out where the islands were. And if they found one, they didn't remember it very well. And once they figured out where it was, if, if he moved them around, they had trouble figuring out where it had gone. You know, they weren't good at this at all. But <laughs> he didn't kill them as many, you know, scientists do. He kept them alive. And when they were older, he did a different experiment. An experiment, by the way, that NIH would not fund. So he funded it out of his own lab funds. Half of these rats at different lead levels were put into standard USDA cages where they've been their whole lives. And the other half were put into kind of interesting pet cages. Um, 
with little colored wheels and toys and all kinds of other things. And the interesting thing is that the rats, even as adults who were put into the interesting cages, became capable, ended up being able to do the water maze as well as the other rats and um, their nerve cells actually um, branched out and became more connected, which is pretty amazing. And so, I mean, we, we think of things like, you know, lead exposure as having, you know, a permanent risk um, uh, for people, um, maybe not. As I said, you know, uh, those of us born between about 50 and, and 80 had a, a lead impact. First time my blood lead was taken, I worked, I was already, <laughs> I was a physician. I had my public health degree. I had finished a pediatric residency. I was in my first job at the California Department of Health and my blood lead level was 14, which right now to a parent would say, that kid is hopeless, will never be able to do anything, right? So I drive a lot of hope from Tomas's work. <laughs> I, had, I had stepped into our lead lab and they said, can I use you as a control? And you know, that's, that's what they got, 14. So I think about my own family in this regard as well. And here's another thing that popped up here again. I'm sorry about that. I must have done that. Um, but my grandparents were immigrated to this country as children and probably suffered quite a bit of hardship before they came here. But my grandfather, who came here when he was nine, um, was five foot seven, died early, 52. My grandmother, um, um, actually says five, seven, she wasn't five, seven. My grandmother was more like five, two. She died at age 67. Um, my uncle, five, 11, died at the age of 88. And my father, six feet tall at 92 years old. Now I showed you a slide that said height is heritable, but these two are a lot taller than these, right? And they lived a lot longer. And so humans too, I think, like rats, ex, you know, do respond to being in a better environment. And a lot of us have experienced that, you know, through our own families, but we demographically see that. And it is a reason for us to be, uh, I think, uh, very um, passionate about wanting to create better environments for people generally. So toxic stress, um, when we have um, frequent, prolonged, or severe adversities, um, if, if children in particular have the absence of a safe, safe stable, and nurturing relationships, um, over time, this is, this is, um, this is health-harming or maladaptive. Racism causes toxic stress. Racism is one of the few documented causes of preterm birth. It's, um, it's, it's very stressful. So when we look at the CDC data, on the right-hand side there, diseases. What are the diseases that kill people? And this was before COVID. COVID would be on this list now, unfortunately. But myocardial infarction, cerebral vascular disease, lung cancer, chronic lower respiratory disease, unintentional injury, renal failure, back you know about a couple of decades ago now, that's primarily what was killing people in this country and still is. But Sandro Galea, another colleague of ours, um, at Boston University said, what if we look at the underlying causes of these disease? How would we rank causes of disease? And with his analysis, and, and I think it's provocative, but I think it's important. Low education, 245,000 premature deaths a year. Racial segregation, 176,000. Low social support, 162,000 individual poverty, income inequality, and then poverty in your area, three separate measures of poverty. Um, Sandro is a social scientist, but I think that these are very important um, numbers to think about that. And again, going back to one of my first slides, which is our lack of investment in social support, that once you have a heart attack, you can get into our emergency room, we'll treat you, we'll give you a cabbage, we'll, um, if you have that stroke, you know, we'll make sure you get some TPA to try to clear that clot, but will we address these causes? 
we don't spend to address these causes. Um, hmm. Yes, I think you can see this. And so this is, this is just a model um, that um, um, Nelson et al. put together about how adversity in childhood is linked to physical and mental health throughout life, but trying to put together the social and environmental and other adversities with the biology in terms of what's actually happening um, with epigenetic changes, disruption of neurodevelopment, reprogramming of stress and immune regulatory systems. And then at the end of the day, risks, whether it's for cognitive de deficits, disease, um, social problems, psychopathology. But, uh, and, and, and I think this kind of understanding um, is helping to inform, you know, that we, when we're talking about health disparities and talking about social determinants of health, what does that really mean in terms of, you know, the biology of what's happening to people? Is it just rhetoric, you know, which I think, you know, Dr. Oman wouldn't like us to do, or do we have a basis for saying that we can make a difference for people's health? I would say we have a basis uh, for it. So um, going back to um, the environment, um, what can we do? We do know in terms of the natural environment that we can expose people to nature. There are many urban areas across the world where people have very little contact with the natural environment at all. And, um, and to redesign communities so that we can derive the health benefits from the natural environment is certainly wise. Um, social determinants, there's so many things that we can do. And in some cases, we piecemeal do them in terms of food, food deserts and food sufficiency. Doctors now are trying to start prescribing food. I, I will say I'm a little bit cautious about some of that food is medicine stuff. Like what kind of food? What, what do we mean by medicine? Where is the evidence? But I do think that it is important that people do not often have access to nutritious food. And innovations that people are trying around the world, like minimum income or raising minimum wages to be able to provide people with more resources for their families, um, as well as in our communities in general, supporting social emotional needs of children, families, the elderly. Um, so much that needs to be done, um, especially here. Um, the built environment, we have to be committed to reversing the many years of structural racism. We can't say, well, that's just the way the community was developed. We can't do anything about it. That, that's, I don't think, going to work for us. That isn't going to provide the health benefits that we need. We need to clean up the contaminated sites that are inequitably distributed across our, our, our um, country. Um, we need to green, especially redlined areas, areas that traditionally were redlined. We have to be committed to providing the same protections in those areas that we provide others. Where do the levees go? Who's protected from floodings? The, the higher income communities get the levees. And there is great research uh, that shows that. Justice in permitting um, Houston has uh, some problems with that because the state environmental agency does not enforce pollution standards against the petrochemical industry. It just does not. But it could do that um, with um, more, um, some other areas that really need to be addressed, um, like justice and voting and all of that. But cracking down on local pollutions and expecting regulatory agencies to do more, making our environments more child and aging friendly. What do I mean by that? Children need parks and places to play. And there are many communities that just don't have those. In DC, some of the work that we've done with the schools, we had to get very innovative, such as let's build the playground on the roof of the school. There was no open area around the school for children to play, elementary school children. Build a playground on the roof any way that you can to find a way to, for children to be able to go outdoors, not just experience nature, but also have activity. And certainly making um, communities um, more aging friendly um, is another piece. So this is the picture that you used. And um, I, which I, 
I think it's a great photo because it, it shows something that I know very well, and not just the proximity of the homes to these factories. That is the Houston, Houston chip channel along there, that line of um, stacks. And actually, the one that's kind of dirtier looking, I think that's actually the Valero plant that had the release. I actually think that's it. And uh, to just see how close that is to the homes uh, where people are living. And to also think about you know, what it means then to have all of that flood, including have spills of chemicals from those facilities into those floodwaters. And I think that gives you a picture of the kind of stress that some of these communities live under, as well as um, I, don't, I don't think that those stack emissions look like they're just um, water vapor, actually. So anyway, I'm not, one, one thing that has been done and I, that I, I learned about at that same visit a couple of weeks ago is that the local university, um, university um, Rice University has environmental health people who have been providing portable monitors to some of the community groups and they're beginning to monitor for VOCs in their own yards. And I think that's incredibly powerful because you know, going back to now you know, the legacy of slavery, this is a community that's been here a very long time and where people settled after the end of the Civil War. And they have never had, many of them, the opportunity to move beyond the kind of life that they're living here. Um, when you consider the schools, the pollution, the stress they live under, the economics of what they um, inherited, which was nothing um, from the plantation owners um, when, you, when you go back that far. And being able to empower the members of a community like this to take some of their matters into their own hands, do monitoring, learn about the, the environment around them, um, be able to take that information uh, to the county, to the city, uh, I think this is critical. And, um, um, it, it, it was exciting to see how energized people were around doing that. So uh, that's the end of my presentation. I thank you for listening and I know we have some time for questions. Elaine. <laughs> But um, again, thank you so much for what an oh, well, thank you so much for uh, what an exciting lecture and the idea that last slide showing just the proximity and uh, you know on the horizon all the uh, stacks is really important. Um, I wanted to go back to one of the comments that you meant because I've been struggling a bit about this whole concept of catch up growth and this goes back to your focus on on uh, uh, pediatrics and some of my focus on development and you know everybody keeps saying oh there's catch up growth there's catch up growth and you know the ability for us to be able to measure and characterize that lack of impacts is always a, a big struggle. So I was really glad you went back on that because you know, with climate change and so forth, people say, oh, people are resilient, there's all this part. And I think that with the children and the lack of catch-up growth in all contexts is so important and different sex differences in the timing of which kids make up those, those uh, gaps and so forth. So I was glad you went back on, on that in particular. So then the real question is then about the epigenetics, because, you know, we've been looking and, you know, I almost think personally, some of the things with the epigenetics, you know, so we want to have this non um, uh, nucleotide based uh, uh, genetics signal that will continue to go forward. But there's a lot of context around that. And I almost think just like we have extant exposure, that we should have some of the extant pathways that are there and the hormone responses. So you brought up some, and you made a note about non-dose response relationships with hormones. Do you, do you think you could connect those thoughts or think a little bit more about you know, epigenetics, cortisol, stress in our homostatic pathways that keep us doing what we're theoretically doing? Um, 
I mean, I, th I think I think what you're asking is a really interesting question, Elaine. If I understand it, you know, right, and that is that, you know, when you when you consider the cumulative impact of a number of insults that are are, are attacking, are you going to see even the same epigenetic response to the same substance, for example? One person is under stress, has a heightened cortisol response. Um, one person um, may have, because of having, you know, nutritional deprivation during pregnancy and being born low birth weight and, and may have a different insulin response. And, and then that is certainly going to have downstream impacts. And many of those, we don't know what they are. It is very, very difficult. I've done some of it, you know, with epidemiology um, cohorts. It's very, very difficult to discern, to be able to cleanly just look at one impact. Uh, some of the work I'm doing right now, I'm working with somebody um, at AM who works with mice. And, and so we don't find that so surprising, but it's a wrap. Yes. No, well, it's surprising <laughs> to me because, you know, no, I've gone her whole life without working, uh, doing anything, having to do anything with mice, to be honest. But I mean, but the thing is that you can cleanly, you know, look at one thing. You can look at one thing. And when you have people who live in a setting like this, it, it, when you have a multitude of insults that people are, are exposed to, it's hard to do that. I, I, I think the other thing I'd say about that is that we look again and again at lymphocytes. We're looking at blood and it may not be the right place to see the important changes. Most of the diseases that I showed you are not blood diseases. They, they are diseases that are in other organs. And with, with mice, we can access various tissues. We can't do that with people. Now I will say, <laughs> mice don't have very much adipose tissue. I mean, there are a lot of downsides that I'm learning about. I don't touch that stuff, by the way. But um, <laughs> no, thank you so much for that comment because you're know, talking about the exposome, but it's the actual measured impacts that are so so broad based that I think it's. But there are, there are cascades of things that yes, happen yes. in both development and in responses. You know, I mean, I mean, if just just look at the, look at the inflammatory response alone. Only that inflammation. We're still identifying how that works, and we don't really know everything about how that works. I mean, those of you who are interested in that kind of thing, there's a lot to do. A lot to do. Anyway. <laughs> Here, so we can see. Oh questions yeah, we can see the people on screen. I can, I know how to do that. Yeah, yeah. I do. We we actually have um, a raised hand from uh, Dr. Jim Guadino. Uh, Jim, are you able to unmute yourself? I'm gonna try and. Jim, Hi. Yes. floor is yours. Oh, thank you so much. Um, hi, Dr. Goldman. I'm here in Portland, Oregon. Uh, 30 years ago, I was in training at UC Berkeley and at the state preventive medicine program, and you were an inspiration to all of us. Um, we also learned early on with COVID that some of the same maps that you presented, uh, identifying communities uh, where there were health disparities, also did a pretty good job predicting who would suffer, which communities would suffer the worst uh, outcomes, death, et cetera, due to COVID. Um, I was, would appreciate your perspectives on the role of public health professionals like us, epidemiologists, um, and how we could join communities to uh, start taking more action with the evidence that we already have. We, there's a lot to know, but I think we know enough uh, and people are still suffering to help uh, partner to move things uh, forward. Thank you so much. Thank you for that question, Jim. And, and, I, and I should remind everybody that there's still way too many, many people dying of COVID every single day um, in this country. And we, we wanna forget about it because we wanna move past it, but we shouldn't. It's now in the top 10 causes of death, probably number six or seven. It is not trivial that over the last three years, we have a new disease that has worked its way into the top 10 overnight. You know, 
boy, wouldn't we love to do that in some other way, you know? <laughs> but I, I think your point is very well taken. And that is that um, COVID for most of, of most people, uh, I don't think most people in public health, but most other people has uncovered the fact that those who have chronic diseases, who have underlying conditions are far more likely to die from many other causes. Um, one of the, I think, problems with our whole system for recording causes of death is that we fail to capture a lot of that in the system. We really do. Um, there, there's a, still a tremendous amount of overhang of excess death from COVID that's not explained directly from COVID and that people are trying to explain by saying, well, it's the stress that was caused by our, our isolation and these other things. But it's, it's also probably true that the virus itself um, has done things to our bodies uh, that are continuing to cause morbidity and mortality, even if um, we don't now have it. But I do think that communities, as you said, uh, Jim, communities increasingly are understanding um, that, that there is that vulnerability. And I do think that there's an opening for those of us in public health who wanna go out there into community-based work um, to do that. Um, we have um, in my, I think yesterday, one of my faculty members who does that kind of work, Wendy Ellis was here. Did anybody see her movie? Um, um, Wendy is very um, interested in building the resilience of communities uh, to, uh, to support people who have experienced trauma of different kinds. And I, I think that, um, at, and, and her life you know, has been very impacted by actually racism. I think that's what her movie was about that you saw yesterday, right? But um, that the communities that she works with have been extremely receptive to that kind of thing. And I think COVID in particular has brought it home in terms of what they experienced in the way of, of you know, deaths and losing people. Um, but I, you know, another part of it, how many of you know people who died from COVID and their, their families don't talk about it. The obituary doesn't say that. I know several people. And so that we still stigmatize, um, you know, death. It's like, is this the Middle Ages and it's plague? And we think that it's something coming from, you know, something we did. But we, we still have these stigmas that I think do get in our way of honestly dealing with some of these things. Yes, hi. Thank you. Uh, it's wonderful, inspiring talk. Uh, so I'm John Holland. I am an occupational medicine physician. I actually uh, graduated from this program and Dr. Roman was my thesis advisor. So it's really priv privileged to be here. But uh, at, a, at a higher level, I mean, I deal with occupational health issues. You know, I read about the environmental health, health issues. Don't deal with them at your level. But since you've worked in government agencies and now um, you know, a position to talk to people about bigger issues. What would be, if there, if we took away politics and there was a certain amount of money to spend on environmental health issues to remedy this, is it like regulation of individual chemicals? Would you put it into raising income levels? Um, I mean, what would be two or three practical things you could do if you were really in charge and you had some money to change things? Well, in a way, that question is an oxymoron because if I were really in charge and could just do what I wanted to, it, it wouldn't be anything that would sound practical to anybody in the room, right? Because, yes, you, know, yeah, you know, my real dream would be that we could, in, in many ways, turn the system upside down, put much more emphasis on prevention and do everything that we could to incentivize prevention in the healthcare system, which unfortunately most of the system is not incentivized to do prevention. Most of the system is incentivized to do medical care and even employers don't really necessarily plan to be covering their employees over a long period of time where they would reap the benefits of, of prevention. And so, you know, figuring out how do you change the incentive structure in our healthcare system, how do you make our system more like other systems across the world where there isn't this wall between healthcare and public health? 
our, our, our public health system is so separated from the healthcare system in a way that, it, it, and I think during COVID, we saw that some of the fabulous work that came out of the UK that would not have been possible here, was not possible here um, because of the fact that, you know, even our NIH, which did the, the wonderful warp speed um, work, but they weren't actually doing surveillance. They weren't actually doing the implementation science to get the vaccines to people. They weren't doing the behavioral science that, that needs to be done. But so realistically, <laughs> realistically, one, I think that we need, uh, I, I think that our system can realistically um, get much, much better at how it uses data and data science and, you know, um, tracks what's going on um, with health and informs, you know, the public about it. Realistically, in terms of the environment, yes, we can have better regulation. I, I think we have spotty regulation. I, I think actually, you know, your regulatory systems in Washington aren't bad. I don't think Californians are bad, but I get to Houston, it's pretty bad, actually. It's pretty bad. You talk to people about, you know, they see, they smell these releases, they hear the announcements to evacuate on the plant site and nothing's being done for them. That's pretty bad. And they call and complain and nobody responds. So we, we do have inconsistency in enforcement and, and how the standards are developed. Um, and, and we had some an enormous backsliding, frankly, during the Trump administration with some of the good things that EPA um, has done, could be doing. Um, so our political system, I wish we could say we could abandon that. See, that's how you started this. And <laughs> we can't. You know, we, we are, we, you know, we're enmeshed in a political system, but it's very, very detrimental that a presidential election can cause the appointment of officials who just hate the mission, hate, you know, the mission of the Environmental Protection Agency, the FDA, or any other, any other entity that's there to do good for us and undermine it. That's not good. And, but yet that is the political system that we have. I, I don't know. Yeah. Hi, um, I was curious if you'd taken a look at redlining from an environmental justice perspective and if you could talk on that for a minute or just a second. Well, really, the, the label for what I was showing you, all of this is an environmental justice issue. So without using the words environmental justice, I think I was defining it. And, I, and when the term environmental justice was first um, invented, there really wasn't very much science to back it up. There wasn't much. And I, I think that we're at a completely different place now. I, I think we understand very well that you know, where people live is a major determinant of their health. Now, do we understand exactly how and why that happens and what we can do about it? We have a lot of work to do on that. Yeah, no, you're right. It, that is, those are the, right. Um, what do you think about sort of the future of environmental health sciences, um, especially with regard to studies like these, where you have a social science or historical context, and then you also have um, like epigenetics and the scientific part? What do you think about the collaboration or do you still see the future as being very divided because people are so focused on their expertise? Well, I think this, the future very much involves everybody, not just environmental health scientists, being able to get out of our silos and work in teams with others that have different expertise and learning how to be respectful of that expertise. And then I will tell you, it is not easy. The different, different fields, it's because I've been in groups like this, different fields sometimes use the very same words to mean different things. So it, it, it requires some patience and communication today, but I think in the future, I mean, I'm hoping you're doing this, I'm sure you are, we're trying to do this to train people 
more, you know, in team science settings and in interdisciplinary settings. So they don't have to wind up, you know, like I did, you know, um, already, you know, through all the training and then suddenly like, okay, how am I going to communicate with these social scientists, these engineers, you know, I mean, people from coming from completely different um, backgrounds, but we, we, we kind of have to do that. The simple problems that could be dealt with, you know, one discipline at a time, I, I, I think are not the most interesting problems uh, today. Um, So, so I think I've been given the, the what is it, the cane um, to, to, to try and wrap this up. Thank, Thank you. you very much, uh, Professor Goldman. Uh, it's a pleasure to have you here as our OMEN uh, guest lecturer and our seminar speaker. Uh, uh, we, I believe, are going to continue the conversation upstairs. Uh, and so uh, thanks for all the visitors online and apologies for the initial technical difficulties, but uh, the recording for uh, Professor Goldman's uh, talk uh, will be posted to our seminar website. Uh, and so uh, if you'd like to follow up on things that uh, Professor Goldman uh, mentioned, please uh, visit our website. Thank you so much. Thank you all.